A 51-year-old man presents to you with chest pain that he thinks is indigestion. <clears throat> he was well until two weeks ago when he noticed tightness in the center of his chest after a large meal and while walking uphill. The tightness stopped after two to three minutes of rest. A similar discomfort has occurred several times since then, sometimes during exercise and sometimes at rest. He gave up smoking one pack of cigarettes per day three years ago and has been told that his blood pressure is a little high. He is otherwise well and takes no medications, but he is worried about his health, particularly about heart disease. He lost his job six months ago and has no health insurance. A complete physical examination and resting electrocardiogram are normal except for a blood pressure of 150 over 96 millimeters of mercury. This patient is likely to have many questions. Am I sick? How sure are you? If I am sick, what's causing my illness? How will it affect me? What can be done about it? As the clinician caring for this patient, you have the same kinds of questions, although yours reflect greater understanding of the possibilities. Two of the questions confronting you include, is the probability of serious, treatable disease high enough to proceed immediately? And how accurate are those diagnostic tests that we used? For example, how accurate will an exercise stress test be in either confirming or ruling out coronary artery disease? Clinicians need answers to these kinds of questions in order to make the best possible medical decisions for their patients. Diagnosis is an imperfect process, resulting in a probability rather than a certainty of being right. The doctor's certainty or uncertainty about a diagnosis has been expressed by using terms such as rule out or possible before a clinical diagnosis. That being the case, clinicians should be familiar with the mathematical relationships between the properties of diagnostic tests and the information they yield in various clinical situations. The goal of this module is to learn the statistical concepts that underpin and are used in medical decision making. All screening and diagnostic tests have certain amounts of validity and reliability. We will learn what these words mean and how the validity and reliability of a test affect the usefulness of the test. Accurate tests are valid and precise tests are reliable. Validity and reliability are independent of each other. When we ask whether a test is valid, we are asking whether the test assesses what it purports to assess. We want to have confidence that we are measuring what we intend to measure. That's why we want to use valid tests. To test walking speed, you could use a small wearable speedometer, or you could choose to use a bathroom scale. Which of these two test devices has face validity for assessing walking speed? On the face of it, the speedometer is the more valid test. Let's say you have a test for blood glucose and you measure blood glucose in a group of seven-year-olds. You then wait and assess whether these children develop type 2 diabetes as adults. What you want to know is whether your childhood test for blood glucose predicts adult diabetes. If it does, your test has predictive validity. Here's another example of this. Think about the following. Let's say that a researcher knows that one of the symptoms of major depression is psychomotor slowing. Folks move more slowly than they used to. The researcher wants to use a mouse model of depression to test the effects of an experimental new drug. The symptom of depression that the researcher chooses to model with the mice is psychomotor slowing. Unbeknownst to the researcher, the particular mice that have been chosen to serve as the model have nerve damage, which causes them to walk slowly. A test using these mice would not have construct validity for depression because the mice walk slowly for reasons that have nothing to do with the reason that people with depression move slowly. The cause and effect of the construct are not the same as the cause and effect of reality. Here's another example of this. Tests or studies also have particular levels of internal and external validity. A test has internal validity if all potential confounding factors are controlled for. For example, if you want to examine the efficacy of a new pain reliever, you want the group that gets the drug and the control group that gets the placebo to be matched on all other factors such as age, sex, health status, etc. A test has external validity if its results can be generalized. For example, if your test included both men and women, then it can be generalized to the real population, which includes both men and women. If you'd only tested women, then your results could not be generalized to the real population. They would not be external validity. 
Here's another example of this. A reliable test gives the same or very similar result every time it is used to measure a variable that has not changed. Like validity and reliability, accuracy and precision do not depend on each other. A test can be accurate, but not precise. A test can be precise, but not accurate. All combinations of precision and accuracy are possible. The dartboards in the next slide illustrate this nicely. As you can see in example A, the dart thrower can be both accurate and precise, as in A, accurate only, as in B, precise only, as in C, or neither accurate nor precise, as in D. In this example, accuracy is shown by darts hitting the board with unbiased placement to one location. The test measured what you wanted it to measure. Precision is shown by the darts being tightly clustered. The test measured the same thing repeatedly. It was reliable. In example B, you can see that when there is bias, the errors are not random. They are biased towards a particular part of the board. Another way to think about accuracy and precision is by thinking about what is being shown in these curves. The test is accurate if the true value is at the peak of the curve. The test is precise if the curve is pointy and there is little spread. A test accuracy is considered in relation to some way of knowing whether the disease is truly present or not. Sounder indication of the truth often referred to as the goal standard or reference standard or criterion standard. Since there is variability among healthy people, there will be a range of normal values. The values within this normal range are the reference values. These values are set to cover 95% of the healthy population. That leaves 5% of the healthy population outside of the reference range, 2.5 with very low values and 2.5 with very high values. These values are false positives. You may think that a person with values in these ranges is ill when in fact they are not. False positive and false negatives can both occur because there are a range of values for both the healthy and the diseased populations. You'll see this in the next slide. Decreasing false positives means increasing false negatives. This conundrum requires medical decision making. The physician has to decide when false positives are acceptable since patients with positive test results will have to undergo further testing. Importantly, the physician also has to decide whether a false negative would be dangerous. Failing to find some diseases when they are really present could be dangerous. Let's move our person around on this figure and make decisions about the health status of the person. Let's have a person with a serum calcium concentration of 9.5 milligrams per deciliter. We could be pretty confident that that person does not have hyperparathyroidism. Now let's have a person with a serum calcium concentration of 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. Hmm. If the person was really from population A, but we decided that he had hyperparathyroidism, we would be making a false positive. Physicians have to decide when false positives are acceptable. Since patients with positive test results will have to undergo further testing and they might be made anxious by an initial positive result. Importantly, physicians also have to decide whether a false negative would be dangerous. Failing to find some types of diseases when they actually exist could be dangerous. In order to make these decisions, it is helpful for physicians to know a couple of important things about the test that was used to obtain the initial result. If you are relying on a test result to make a medical decision, you will want to know two things about the test itself. You'll want to know how sensitive it is, that is, is the test good at detecting what is really there, and you'll want to know how specific the test is. That is, does the test fail to detect something that is really not there? Knowing how sensitive and specific a test is can help a physician make decisions about the meaning of a positive or a negative test result. Both sensitivity and specificity can be quantified, and this helps us with decision making.
There are four possibilities after a test has been run. The result could be a true positive as an A, the person tested positive and the disease is really present. The result could be a false positive as in B, the person tested positive but does not really have the disease. The result could be a false negative as in C, the person tested negative but really does have the disease. Or the result could be a true negative as in D, the person tested negative and really does not have the disease. When the numbers from actual tests are plugged into these four boxes, we will be able to calculate sensitivity and specificity according to the equations that are shown. We will do this in class. A very sensitive test should be used when failing to find a disease that really exists, that is, a false negative, is really dangerous or deadly. This is understandable. However, you will be following up on a higher number of false positives under these circumstances than you would had you used a less sensitive test. Sensitive tests are used for screening or to rule out the disease. You can rule out the disease in people who test negative on a sensitive test. Remember, sensitive tests are used to rule out the disease. A very specific test is used to correctly identify people who do not have the disease. A test with 100% specificity would be negative for every person without the disease. A positive result on such a test means that it is very likely that the disease is present. A test with high specificity results in few false positives and should be used when false positives could be dangerous or serious. For example, you would not want to start someone on chemotherapy unless you were very, very sure or certain that the person had cancer. A false positive for cancer that leads to the use of chemotherapy could be bad. Very specific tests are used to confirm or rule in a disease. These tests are called confirmatory or diagnostic tests. Well, sensitivity and specificity can help you make decisions about acceptable levels of false positives and false negatives. They do not tell you about the probability that a patient with a positive test result actually has the disease. Similarly, they do not tell you about the probability that a person with a negative test result really does not have the disease. To obtain these probabilities, we calculate the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value of the test. We can also use the 2x2 two two matrix to make calculations of positive and negative predictive value. To calculate positive predictive value, the number of people in box A will become the numerator in a ratio, and the total of the numbers in boxes A and B will become the denominator. This is the number of people with positive results who actually have the disease, true positive, divided by the total number of people with a positive test result. To calculate negative predictive value, the number of people in box D will become the numerator, and the total of the numbers in boxes C and D will become the denominator. This is the number of people who tested negative that really do not have the disease, true negative, divided by the no total number of people who tested negative. We will make these calculations in class. Remember that even in a healthy population, 2.5% of the people will have values above and 2.5% will have values below the reference range. Think about what would happen if you were to move the cutoff to the right or the left in the figure. If we move it to the left towards the healthy population, we'll catch more people who actually have the disease. This would be important if the disease is particularly dangerous. However, the number of false positives will go up. More people might be made unnecessarily anxious and have to undergo another test. If you were to move the cutoff towards the disease population, the number of false negatives would go up, and we would miss people who really have the disease. Receiver Operating Characteristic, or ROC, curves can be used to decide what an appropriate cutoff for a particular test should be. We'll take a look at these curves in a moment. First, take a look at the history of the construction of these curves. It's pretty interesting, and it provides a great explanation for why such curves are used for making medical decisions. ROC curves plot sensitivity on the y-axis against the false positive error rate on the x-axis. Take a look at this ROC curve for a test for systolic blood pressure. You want to decide whether your patient who underwent this test has high blood pressure which should be treated. Which blood pressure would you decide is high enough to warrant treatment? 160 millimeters of mercury? 130 millimeters? 
How can you use this curve to make that decision? The sensitivity of this test for 160 millimeters of mercury is not that great. However, if you chose this as the cutoff for deciding that a patient has high blood pressure, there will be very few false positives. The sensitivity for 130 millimeters of mercury is pretty good. However, if you chose this as the cutoff, there will be a lot more false negatives. Different sensitivities and specificities can result in ROC curves that are differentially useful and good. When sensitivity and false positive error rate are always equal, you really get no benefit from the curve. The shape of the ROC curve reflects the quality of the test. The better the test, the more the curve looks like line A. It rises quickly and then describes a straight horizontal line. This can be quantified in terms of area under the curve. The worst area under the curve is 0.5, as in line C, and the best is 1.0, which is shown in line A. Generally, an area under the curve of 0.5 to 0.6 is practically useless. An area under the curve of 0.6 to 0.7 is the result of a poor curve, 0.7 to 0.8 is fair, and 0.8 to 1.0 is a very good area under the curve.